Okay, so I'm going to go first. Uh, can I first have a, a show of hands? Uh, I would like to know people that work in data science. If you guys can show your hands. A show of hands, people that work in data science that already know NumPy and those kind of things. Okay, because just, just, just a census, because uh, this talk is not, is not so much for you as the others. Uh, okay, it's for, for those people that are not familiar, but I hope that uh, you also take something with you. Okay, so uh, let's get started. <clears throat> okay, um, I want to multiply these two matrices. What is going to be the result of this operation? The, the guys from mathematics. Renat, what is going to be the, the, the result of this operation? Well, this is the inverse of the identity matrix, so it's going to, to flip the, the matrix. Um, okay, uh, I would like to implement this. Uh, what language uh, will this be? Do you guys have any idea of what language is this? There are many languages to make, uh, to, make uh, to use for computing, for, the, for scientific computing. Do you guys know what language is this? Uh, it's Python, actually. It's Python. Um, okay. <laughs> it's it's Python. If you guys know. okay, are you guys convinced? Yes. Okay. Um, this would be something uh, similar in C plus plus, using uh, Armadillo, uh, a package uh, for, for for C plus plus. Okay. Uh, so why am I showing this? Uh, because I, I think I think people um, think too much in terms of programming languages, and they don't consider the ecosystem. Just to take take the idea home that the, the ecosystem is is more important than the programming language. And uh, in the case of Python, there are also very interesting things about the language that makes it easier to work with. But uh, the most important part is the ecosystem around Python. I think. Uh, Python is a, a good choice for scientific computing because uh, you can interoperate uh, with uh, uh, more easily than other, and other languages with the rest of, uh, of your stack, including you can develop your entire stack in Python, including the web development. So, uh, furthermore, uh, uh, the computations of themselves are not computed in Python. When, when you use a package like, uh, like this, like NumPy, uh, everything is implemented either in C or Fortran. Uh, so it's, it's not going to be uh, uh, the, the art stuff. It's going to be, it's going to be as fast as, as, as another language. <clears throat> OK. So, uh, in terms of uh, scientific computing, usually people use something like MATLAB or R or, or Python. Um, this is just to, to give you a, an overview. In, in R, you have, uh, you have too many packages to choose from. Everybody develops the, their own package. Um, in Python, things are a little, well, they, they are not developed by a monopolized uh, company like MathWorks for MATLAB, but um, but uh, you have, um, there is a, a kind of consensus, there is a, a strong community, and, um, and, um, and uh, things uh, fit better, I think, than, than languages like R. And, uh, and uh, they are more dynamic than MATLAB. Okay, uh, this is uh, a graphic to show it. Like, uh, everybody can choose the, their, own, uh, their own graphic, right? There are graphics that show that show that R is, uh, is superior in terms of uh, data mining, for instance. This is for data mining, uh, right? Data science or machine learning. Um, there are, it depends a lot on, uh, on who you ask or uh, what approach is. Uh, this is. This approach is based on, on results from Google. Um, so we have first Python and then Java and then, then the others uh, to work with, uh, with machine learning. <coughs> Okay, so let's introduce NumPy because this is this is the foundation uh, when working with Python when working with Python for, for scientific computing the, the foundation is NumPy. Okay, and what is what is uh, NumPy is the is the linear algebra package. Go ahead. 
NumPy is the is the is the is the linear algebra package that uh, that supports everything else. Okay, everything is is designed around NumPy. In if you want to do anything any kind of data analysis, everything will be uh, will have NumPy uh, at the bottom. Uh, these are, are just some differences between the languages. Uh, in Python, the, the operations are uh, in NumPy. I mean, the operations are element-wise. So when uh, when they use the, the multiplication operator, uh, this will uh, this will um, multiply element by element. It's not going to be the outer product. For the outer pro outer dot product, use uh, use the, the dot uh, the dot uh, function. If you want to use the, the mathematical uh, outer product. Um, okay. Other differences. Uh, in in um, in general, I find indexing uh, nicer in Python uh, because you have all kinds of short ends, including to start from the end. It supports the basic uh, um, the basic indexings from from lists. So NumPy uh, NumPy arrays support the same kind of ind indexing with lists. That is very a very comfortable, a very flexible indexing system. Um, I find it uh, nicer than. Than the, the alternatives. Uh, plus, you can you can do things like this: uh, start uh, two by two, right? Starting zero uh, to ten, two by two, which uh, which are not as comfortable in other in other languages. Uh, okay, something also nice about NumPy is uh, arithmetic broadcasting. It's something that uh, doesn't exist in MATLAB or R. Uh, uh, well, it exists in, in Octave. There is an implementation, implementation, a, a free implementation of MATLAB called Octave, an open source implementation that does uh, arithmetic broadcasting. Uh, the idea is that the last axis, when you have, for instance, a matrix, if you multiply a matrix with another, I'm going to show you guys this, but uh, um, but uh, they can differ in the last axis. Uh, I'm going to show you guys this. So. Uh, so let's let's import here a couple of images. Uh, they have these these shapes. So uh, this image is a color image. So it has a width an eight, uh, 50, uh, 512 per 512, and then you, you have three channels that are RGB. This one is a grayscale image, so it only has the width and the eight of the image. Uh, we can see the images. We can do the the plot. Uh, Matplotlib, well, Zhuang is going to talk about it, but it's similar to, to Matlab uh, uh, plot functions. Um, um, anyway, this is an RGB. It has this format. This is a grayscale. So we would like to do, for instance, an average of the images. Okay? <coughs> what, how can you do the average? Well, first we need to introduce a new axis to the, to the grayscale image so that uh, it becomes uh, five, 512 per 512 per 1, okay? It needs to have uh, that additional axis. Uh, now, with this uh, additional axis, we can just sum the two, and it will, it will sum the, the R channel of the first image to the, to, to the, to the grayscale of this image, and then it will, it will sum the, the G uh, channel. Etc. This is not possible, like in languages like MATLAB, you have to you have to uh, repeat the the column uh, a few times. You have to repeat the the gray the gray image to turn it to RGB. Okay. So this is something nice. Uh, okay. We also convert it to to another precision so that we can sum so that we don't have overflows. Okay. But that's that's not important. Okay. And then we have uh, we have the average of the two images. Uh, okay, this is the geometric mean. Okay, if you want to do to the geometric mean, it's, it's the square of the product. Okay, and uh, this is what, uh, this is uh, the, the introduction. Then Joan is going to talk about the 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 data visualization. I'm going to talk again about uh, data anal uh, data data analysis and machine learning. And, uh, and we are going to alternate a little bit for use cases, mm -hmm. more use cases and conclusions. Okay, okay. now um, for the next chapter. Oh. oh, wait. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about pandas and um, some libraries, some tools you have in Python for data visualization, that is plotting and stuff. So what is pandas? Um, 
Pandas is a package for data manipulation and analysis that's very inspired on the concept of data frame that's present on the R language. Um, and the cool thing about Pandas is, uh, besides this kind of inspiration, is, is that it's really optimized. Like the most critical parts of the, co of the code base, it's, uh, uh, it's performed in C. So you can really, for example, like, let's suppose you want to, uh, to import a, a CSV, a comma separated value file, okay? Um, there's a function in Pandas which allows to import that, which is much, much faster if you would use like uh, pure Python. Um, this package in particular was developed by this fellow, Wes McKinney, uh, while working for a quant quantitative finance research firm. Um, so, essentially, this package was developed for uh, uh, mostly time series analysis. What, it, when, when, what do I mean by this? It's like anal an analyzing stocks. So, um, why not show you an example of how you can work with this with a data set that's comprised of financial stocks, right? So let me just open um, open up my browser. Okay, this is my the other notebook. Okay, so I'm going to show you how you span this with this tool, which is called Jupyter Notebook. It's basically um, a package uh, which is really apt for exploratory analysis of data, and it's also really cool if you want to like. Um, Let's suppose you're, you're working in a company and you want to show some of your results of your data analysis. You can very easily uh, show it to your, to your employers or other stakeholders in your projects. And it's really easy to work and it really allows to earn an, an iterative way of working. Um, so for starters, I'm gonna import some packages. I'm gonna import pandas and uh, I'm gonna import this one for plotting. And I'm going to import uh, our, our data set. Data set is, compo is comprised by financial stocks. Okay, so uh, right, I just imported. So let's see what are the attributes on this data set. So we can see over, over here, we have the, the date, the ticker. Ticker is basically the company. Um, the opening value, the highest value on, this, on the, oh, by the way, the date is spread by days. The open value is the um, value of the stock during the beginning of that day in particular, highest highest value, low, obvious. Close is the value during, um, during the closing time of, of the stock exchange. And the vo volume um, indicates the, the volume trade on that particular day. Um, and um, well, this data set is comprised of a lot, a lot of companies. So if you want to know how many companies we have in this data set, we can just simply do this. We can just um, uh, call our data frame, which is on this object. It's an object of type data frame. We just uh, uh, use this indexing to call this particular, val this particular column. We create a set, which is an, uh, a built-in function in Python. And we use the length, which is also a built-in function. And we have 524 uh, companies this data set. That's a lot. Uh, so let's try to um, just analyze five, five, most, five most important ones. So. Uh, Basically, here I'm going to use um, uh, the group by, group, group by function, which allows me to um, aggregate the allows me to aggregate the um, uh, rows according to the volume, and then afterwards I will. Uh, uh, oh, okay, and then afterwards I'm going to use this function in particular, then I'm, I'm going to sort it in order to, um, in order to have my, my, um, my, uh, my data frame sorted by the mo by these companies with the biggest, uh, uh volume trade. Mean. And then, mean. Sorry. Mean. yeah, mean, yeah, it's the average yes, yes. as in the arith arithmetic mean. Okay. Uh, then after, afterwards, after having this object, I'm going to choose the five most, uh, five most voluminous companies, so to speak. I'm going to choose a particular, particular company. Then I'm going to call this, fo this following attribute, and then this function, in order to get my uh, the most, most um, the companies with the biggest volume trade. Uh, and these are sorted by, the, by their mean volume. Okay. Uh, and now, over here, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna take a, um, a subset of this data frame, 
with only these columns. In this case, I'm going to only want the company in question, the date, and the volume on that particular day. Okay? And then, uh, um, oh, and by the way, and on this line, I'm just going to I'm going to use this is in in order to choose the only these companies in order to, to have it on my sub data frame. Okay, then I'm going to call this function head. I'm going to choose how many element, many rows I want to show, and it shows here directly on Jupyter. Um, then afterwards, I decided to um, convert this data stamp to um, data date time objects, and. Um, then afterwards, I'm gonna sort all all of these uh, according to the date. Okay, so the first very, very first date of this data set was on the August 21th of 2009. Um, then afterwards, ah, afterwards I'm gonna just choose um, a subset of this data frame again. This time I just want, for example. Uh, uh, Mm, okay, just gonna just gonna want it's actually okay. There's a typo. I, I mean, I mean this 2009. Sorry. So I'm just gonna want the stock starting from October 2009. Okay, I'm gonna pass this condition. It's uh, some kind of pseudo SQL kind of thing, but it's not uh, it's not SQL. Um, then I've I've got the data frame starting from uh, 1st of October. Okay, and um, well. This is still not quite right in order for me to, for example, plot this, the, the evolution of this volume, volume traits uh, during each day. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pivot the data frame and uh, I'm going to use as an index to date. I'm going to want to use as columns the, each company that's, that's here, okay? And I'm, I'm going to choose as the value to be filled over here, my volume, okay? Then. Uh, Afterwards, we get this following data frame. Okay, it's not very good. <laughs> I'm gonna let me just push it over here. Okay, so this is the resulting data frame. And now, um, after these transformations, this is pretty much ready for us to plot our stocks. So I'm gonna plot, I'm gonna plot a line chart, which uh, looks like this. Okay, so we have a plot starting from the October 2009 that goes until uh, around the end of the around around the, the end of August 2010 okay um, there's still quite a bit of diff just still um, yeah there's a quite a difference between the volume trades but uh, another thing we could do to make this plot nicer we could change the, the back end of, of the plotting so I'm gonna choose this um, backend for a matplotlib. I'm gonna choose ggplot, okay? And uh, for this, I've got this aspect, um, this aesthetic, so to speak. Okay, so what we can do following is, okay, for, for all of these stocks, let's just take the, um, the company with the biggest mean volume. Okay, so it's just gonna choose the company C. Okay, um, okay. So we have we have the, the time series uh, with respect to the, to the volume trade during each day, um, and usually we can do we we also can do operations on this. We can perform, for example, moving averages, or um, or also we can apply uh, exponential smoothing over here, and. Uh, Pandas really allows us to do this quite easily. So if you want, for example, uh, a moving average, we just pretty much have to have to call the, the pivoted data frame, okay? And uh, we call up this function, okay, which says that uh, I want a win a rolling window of size, this case, for example, five days. And um, I'm gonna here. I specify the, the operation that I want that to happen on inside that window. Then I'm gonna plot it. So it kind of looks like this. Okay, it's not quite right. Okay. So um, so the red ones, the original original um, original time series. The this bluish one is the uh, one that's processed by the moving average with a window of five days, the purple one, 15 days, 
and the black one uh, 30 days. So this is kind of an operation that usually, it's usually kind of done if you dabble in a technical analysis and that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, analysis on the stocks. Um, the other operation I was mentioning, which is an exponential smoothing, uh, can also be seen as a, a low pass filter uh, compared to uh, comparable to the moving averages, and um, and it's determined most only by this variable, which um, uh, which al allow allows us to control how smooth we want the signal, the original signal or not. Okay, so uh, this is what it looks like. So again, the red one is the original one, the blue one is the um, the exponential smooth with an alpha equals equals to 0 0.5, and the proper one with an alpha equals to 0 0.1. Um, and then, uh, another thing we can do, we can uh, do other kind of plotting with, uh, uh, with pandas and another, another uh, libraries. So I'm gonna take the very first data frame we had, and uh, I'm just gonna choose uh, I'm just just gonna choose one one of one of the um, one of the companies, okay? But now I want to I'm going to want to analyze these remaining variables besides the volume one, okay? So I cho I do think that was very similar to what I did previously uh, up up there, okay? Which results on this data frame, and then afterwards I'm gonna perform a Z standardization of all columns, except the ticker one, which is indicates the company in question that I'm analyzing, and then I'm gonna remove that one through the, the drop function, okay? So, um, for this standardization, I'm pretty much just iterating through, through the columns, and I'm, I'm pretty much removing the arithmetic mean, and I'm dividing by the standard deviation of the values along that column. Um, then afterwards, the drop. Okay, so this is what it looks like, and then with this we can uh, we we are ready to show you a prior plot with the head of a library called Seaborn, which is an um, which is a high level interface for plotting, which allows to create very easily um, very um, interesting and informative plots, uh, especially during um, the exploratory exploratory data analysis stage. Okay, so you just have to import a package and call the function pair plot, uh, pass the sub data frame, and then you have this plot. Okay, not sure if it's gonna fit on the screen. Okay, it's quite big. Um, so yeah, pretty much um, uh, on the di diagonal, it shows uh, the histogram of the, um, of the column itself. For example, here's, here we have the histogram of the of the column open, here of high, low, and so forth. And then uh, on the other ones, we have uh, we have kind of plots of the um, of the pair of the pairs of the variables we are analyzing. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting way to get a uh, uh, feel for the data we are analyzing. Okay, and. Um, and what, what if you wanted to embed, embed in, uh, in this Jupyter notebook a way to interact with the plots itself? Like, for example, if this notebook and just like scroll for chart, zoom in, zoom out, pan, okay? Um, there's a library called Bokeh. It's still kind of um, ex experimental. It's not quite used by a lot of people. Um, but uh, it really easily allows to add interactive plots on Jupyter notebooks. So we can use the Shard API, which allows us to directly pass um, a data frame object, okay? In order to, for example, in this case, I'm gonna perform a scatter plot uh, of the volume and close, okay? so. In here, we have the plot itself, and now we can easily, can, can't use it now, I have to use the mice, mouse, I mean. Okay, now we can pan this, okay? We can pan this, we can uh, zoom in, we can reset, and so forth. Okay, so um, 
these were some of the um, things you can do with pandas and two of and I showed you two interesting packages for data visualization uh, and now I have a question for you um, what other types of data will be perhaps interesting to analyze with the tools I just showed you like uh, for example will be like uh, data sets related to what domains um, there, there's, there's, not the there's not the correct answer, okay? It's just like, uh, just, uh, no, just want to gather some ideas. What do you think, what do you guys think? Block files, whatever kind of log files. Uh, whatever what, sorry? Log files. Log, log files, okay. Yeah, network uh, log files. Right? Mm -hmm. In data centers, you have log files of network devices, so maybe that, or medical data, a lot of medical, mm -hmm. long of patients, you will have a lot of data related to that. Okay. Okay. Any more um, suggestions or ideas? No? Okay. A lot of statistical data. This would be ideal. What, sorry? Statistical. St for, stati for statistics. Okay, okay, okay. The, the visualization of the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think um, I'm finished with this chapter. Now I'm just going to... May I ask you something? Sure. So when you click Save Day, what, what kind of format does it export to? Uh, this notebook. Uh, it it export, exports as a file of the type I can show you over here. Uh, let me just... Okay. <laughs> uh, Okay, not quite what I wanted. Sorry, technical difficulties. Okay, so this pretty much just exports as a file uh, of this kind, okay? For example, what I just showed you is inside this file, okay? So... Uh, not, the, not the Python book, I mean the plot itself, from the book. Uh, oh, okay, the plot itself, okay. Um, in this case, it, it generates them in real time, okay? So with Jupyter Notebook, um, it's What, sorry? <laughs> to save it, uh, it's the image in JPEG. Yeah. Oh, okay, for, for seeing the plots. Yeah, imagine you zoom, you zoom up the picture if it's possible to save only the, the selected data. Okay, okay. Well, in this case, you can choose it for you. Yeah. Okay, in, in this case of bokeh, you have this file, but, if, you but static, uh, if you have static plots, you can use one of the traditional tools. Yeah, Plot exactly. Department. This is more for interactive websites and things yeah, like so that. It's saving PNG and you can change it into PNG and it No, but actually I wanted to know if, if you can save in a format that brings you back to this exact same iterative plot. But uh, this is an interactive plot, it uses HTML and uh, JavaScript. It's like uh, the package in Python, it generates the HTML yeah. and JavaScript. If you have, you can save as a static image, but that's not what the package is for. Yeah, but it, it, will, it, will, it will use like the more, it will use like this kind of notebooks for that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, po it's possible to uh, save the, the images that are generated here in this notebook. Um, so, excuse me, just wait. You can also save the variable where you have the the, the result, and then you can load it with IPython and show it. No, of course. Again, you know, it's very random. But but uh, for example, in Mat MATLAB, you can save the workspace, then you bring it back. The, the yeah, same sure. Plotting sure. Workspace <coughs> in Python at least. Uh, in, in MATLAB, if I can do that. So fine. That's a limitation for me. That's why I'm asking about this situation. Okay. Um, well, note. Well, this notebook in particular it can it can perform checkpoints. So it kind of it's it also saves the data that that exists in the plot. But I admit it's not exactly the same thing as the workspace we have in my lab. It's kind of a it's not exactly the same. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, don't want to interfere. Oh, no, 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 no problem, no problem, no problem, no problem. This package is very cool to use either with IPython or in a website, in a web server. Yeah. With Flask or something like that. Uh, it generates HTML and JavaScript. And if you want, you can also generate static images. But for that, you can use Matplotlib as well. So. 
the advantages and the advantage of, the, of Python over MATLAB with saving the environments is because MATLAB has a, a limitation in terms of memory. If you have a huge data set, it can save it or load it at the same time. And Python, if I'm not mistaken, lets you save and load everything. It can take more time or less time depending on the size, but it doesn't enforce any limitation. Because with MATLAB, I, I, I had a, a, a table, it was very big, and mm -hmm. I had enough memory in disk and in RAM to, to use it, but MATLAB uh, blocked me, and Python never did it. Which is cool, when you deal with huge data sets, mm -hmm. which happen when you do data mining and yeah. things like this. Also, you have a big advantage with Python, that is, you can have a number as big as you want. If you have memory in disk or in RAM, Python never lim limits you. And uh, MATLAB, C, C++, it's not very easy to deal with huge numbers. And here you can have Python as, as arbitrary precision. Yes. Uh, but uh, but uh, if you use it with NumPy, you have to choose the precision. That you yep. have, you lose that. But, uh, yes. If you use NumPy. OK, so it's your turn, I believe. Oh, you already have a microphone. Yes, I, I have a microphone. Okay, that's one. <laughs> okay, so. I'm going to sit down and get some people arrived in the meanwhile. Okay, if you guys want. Okay, uh, scroll back, perhaps. Okay, go ahead. Um, I think in my, in my introduction, I might have been a little too fast. If, uh, if it's a little confusing, you can, like, uh, just show your end, and I, I will I will get slower. But um, uh, what I was getting at in the in the introduction, uh, if uh, if it was not clear, is that Python is a general purpose language uh, as opposite to to R or MATLAB. Okay, it's not for for mathematics, uh, and uh, so you, we use NumPy for because of that we use NumPy objects which uh, which are called uh, arrays. Um, uh, we, uh, the, the index and everything was not for lists, it was for the array objects of NumPy, okay? That was using NumPy array objects, okay? I'm not sure if, I, if it was clear, but uh, I hope now it is. Okay. Uh, so now we are going to do something with, uh, with data. Uh, before, uh, before, before, um, before we work with data, we need data. So let's try to generate something like this. <coughs> Okay, uh, so what uh, old, uh, old, old, uh, what code would produce something like this? Uh, probably we'll need uh, some kind of linear equation. So we have, uh, we have some kind of upward trend here. So that, that's given by the deterministic uh, part. And uh, we also seem to have some kind of noise. Uh, we could maybe modulate this using a normal distribution, and then we have uh, some spikes uh, with uh, some kind of small probability, which we can also model with uh, uh, a normal, uh, the absolute value of, uh, an, uh, of a random variable following a normal distribution. Uh, usually, we don't like when working. Uh, when when doing um, data analysis, usually we don't like if conditions, we don't like uh, this kind of con uh, condition, condition cases. So what we can, we can, for instance, use uh, a Bernoulli process, which with a 10% probability it's one, otherwise it's zero, and we can multiply. So this will be equivalent to this because, because with a 90% with a probability it will be zero. So the, that term will be zeroed out with 10% probability to be one. So we can just multiply with a Bernoulli, with a, uh, a Bernoulli process. This is a, a binomial with uh, two cases, so it's a Bernoulli process. So this is just to this is just to get you started to think like a, a data scientist. <coughs> so let's translate this, this to NumPy. So we are going to need uh, uh, x uh, x bar, uh, values. So we are going to use something like lean space, which, which, which from 0 to 25, it gives us nine, uh, n points, which are, are 50 in this case. So it will give us 0, then 0 0.5, then 1, then 1.5, etc. So it's 
50 points. Then we get the deterministic part. If we multiply a vector by a scalar, it will multiply each element. We can then add uh, another scalar, uh, which is the, the intercept, right? Okay, we then uh, add, uh, the, add that first noise, we then have the, the second noise, okay? With a 10% probability, this will be one, so, okay. Uh, so we generate, if you use matplotlib, we can generate, we can visual, visualize this data, okay? Okay. Uh, okay, what kind of model could you, could you produce to, to explain this data? Well, we could start with a, a linear regression. So we could uh, try to explain the, 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 the deterministic part. We could predict some kind of y uh, by, by summing the beta zero and some beta one with x. Uh, that was what you used to, to produce the data. So. Um, and, um, and what, what, how are we going to find the betas? Well, we are going to minimize the difference between the true y's, which we know what they are in the graph, and we are going to uh, minimize the, the, subtract, the, the difference between those y's and um, the, the, the predicted y's. Uh, then we, we square, why do we square? Because we need the, the, the error needs to be uh, a positive number. So we, we square and for mathematical reasons we usually use square and not uh, another, another power like 4 or, or uh, the absolute value. Um, <clears throat> so how, how do you produce a model like this? Well, we can use scikit-learn. So we are going to import linear regression from my scikit-learn. Um, the, it, has, it has several options in the constructor, okay? Um, uh, every model in, in scikit-learn follows the same pattern, but I, I'm going to, to formalize this next, okay, afterwards, I'm going to formalize this. But uh, they, they have a fit uh, function. The, what fit, fit function does is it takes, uh, it takes uh, a matrix and a vector, Okay, it takes the, the x matrix. In this case, we have uh, uh, the x is a, a vector, so we need to transform it into a matrix. That's why we have another axis that is fourth column. <coughs> so it's going to become a vector with a single column. Okay, several observations and one column. And then we give it the y. Uh, it's going to minimize this difference. It's going to find the betas that minimize this difference. Okay. Uh, when we have the betas, uh, when we have the betas determined, we can predict the other values. In this case, we are going to predict again for the same for the same x, and we are going to plot the results. So this is the result. Okay. So the <coughs> so it found the, it found the, this uh, this slope, and this this the slope is the beta one, and the the b is the is the beta beta zero. Okay, um, <coughs> it doesn't it doesn't quite look like the original model, right? The the beta the beta zero the intercept it looks a little higher than the than the value that you used to generate it. Um, so what could you do with the data? What could you do to try to to find the actual intercept, the the actual ten, the actual b equal uh, equals to ten? Does anyone have any idea what if uh, what could you do maybe to the data, or uh, or if you could use another model, but uh, but maybe we could do something with the data to try to to get to the current the current uh, the current intercept. So the slope looks all right. The slope the slope is is almost two, right? One point one, but the the intercept it looks a little high. Does anyone have any suggestions, you guys? That the Yes, exactly. That that's one suggestion. Yes, but uh, yeah, I'm going to show that next. But uh, what's a simpler approach than that? Maybe manipulate data. Uh, the the data science guys don't have any suggestion. Well, no, that's not going to to do much. That's 
I, well, it might, no, but, uh, well, we could remove the, the spikes. We could just get the, in the data, we could remove the spike. This, this will probably be what a statistician will do. You will probably look at residuals. So if you look at the difference between the predictive alpha and y, we could do maybe a box plot, which, uh, I don't know if you guys remember this from descriptive statistics in college or something like that, but this is a, a caixa bigot in Portuguese, a diagram a caixa bigot. Uh, so we have, we have several outliers here. We have one, two, three, four, five. It actually found more than the, the spikes, but, <laughs> but we could remove these, these values. So we could find the percentiles that are for the residuals we will find the 25 percentile and the, the 75 percentile, so the first quartile and the, the third quartile, and uh, we could only use those values that are between them, right? We could, uh, we could only use the values that, uh, that are here. The box, what box, plus, box plot does is something like this. It shows the dots are above this value. Uh, well, there are no none uh, below it. Uh, so we could remove them and then we could uh, make uh, run the model again and this would have uh, an intercept that's a little closer to the to the real value to the 10 okay just remove the spikes and we have something close to the value okay another approach was already su suggested so uh, instead of, instead of minimizing the square difference we minimize the float value okay um, <coughs> Uh, this is not typically done because uh, mathematically this is more computationally expensive uh, because uh, the derivative of this is a constant. It, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have a nice derivative like a square does. If you, if you derive a square, uh, it's very easy to derive. This one is a, is a constant uh, <coughs> and, uh, and it doesn't uh, have a derivative in when it's zero. So we can, we can, we are going to for this. Uh, Scikit-learn cannot help us, but uh, there is a, there is another, uh, there is another part, uh, package in, in Python that starts models that has a lot of models for, uh, for these kind of things and also for, uh, for time series. Uh, this works a little different from Scikit-learn. Uh, we don't need to, to enter into details, but uh, the constructor and the fit function it doesn't follow the same uh, the same rules as the scikit-learn. But anyway, we could we could use it and we'll produce uh, something closer to the to the actual value because uh, uh, you can show that minimizing the the, the absolute value is the same as uh, finding the the median value. Okay. Um, and the square, you can show that it's, uh, it, it's, fi it's finding the, the expected value, so the mean. So that's why the median is more robust to outliers, the median of, uh, of a distribution. Okay, what will be a third approach to solve this problem? Okay, this one might be a little harder, but we could Instead, instead of, um, we could still use a linear regression, but we could do sampling, okay? We get the data, we get some of the data, and we do a linear regression. Then we get some of the data, and we do another linear regression, etc. And then we find the, the, for instance, there are several posts, but we can do the, the, mean, the mean values of the betas, okay? We have several linear regressions. We do several linear regressions and then we find the mean. And this will be more robust to outliers. Uh, okay, we, we do several linear regressions with bootstrapping and then we do the mean of them. Okay, this will be more robust to outliers. We can do this in scikit-learn using Hansack uh, and you can use this with uh, other models than linear regressions. It doesn't work this approach, it works for, for other for other models to, to build uh, uh, robust, uh, robust models and uh, it, uh, it gives us uh, a pretty robust model to outliers as well. Okay, uh, so what kind of things can you use data mining machine learning for? Uh -huh. So what we have seen here is the, is the uh, regression. So we want to predict a, a variable that is continuous, okay? Um, for instance, we can predict a, a house price with a model like this. In scikit-learn, there are several models for this. Every model uh, derives from the regressor mixin. Okay, this is the the base class. Okay, and uh, this class 
as two main functions that the fit and predict. So every model that does regression in scikit-learn follows this pattern. It has a fit where you give it a matrix and you give it a vector. Okay? The vector is the values that you want to predict. The x is the explanatory variable, so it will be the length size and could be others. Okay? Uh, this finds you the betas in the linear regression and fault or, or other parameters depending on the model. Then you can use the predict to when you don't have a y, you want to for new data where you don't have you don't know the house price, for instance, and but you know the length size. Okay, you want to predict the house price. You have the predict function that it gives you a vector. Okay, this returns this the fit one returns the the actual return self. Okay. For those of you that uh, are more experts in object-oriented programming, this, the fit one returns self so that you can chain it. Okay. Okay. There are other models. There you can also have a classification where you want to predict a discrete variable. So it can be, for instance, in our space, can be expensive or cheap, like uh, depending on that variable if it's outside of the city or not, or something like that, crazy like that. And this derives from the classifier mixin. There are several objects for these kind of things. And you also have uh, the same methods, okay? Only that predict, it gives you classes instead of, uh, instead of giving you a numerical value, a continuous variable, this one is a discrete val va uh, variable. So, um, yeah, the, the, the variables are always represented as numbers, so it's always represented as zero, one, two, three, but, uh, but they, they have no cardinality or ordinality, so they are, uh, they are classes. Well, another type of uh, another type of problem is clustering, where you want uh, you don't want to predict, but you want to aggregate. So you don't have a variable that you want to explain. Uh, you actually you actually don't know what uh, what what you are trying to to get at. For instance, you 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 have a store and you want to find uh, customers that are similar to each other. Okay, you want to find some kind of uh, similarity between in your data, some kind of pattern, but uh, you don't know what uh, you don't have a, a variable that you want to, to explain. So in this, you have the the cluster mixing and several models that come from it. Okay, and we have the fit, and instead of predict, it's the transform that transforms your data, for instance, into clusters. So the, the this these customers that have this age, this this habit or something, they become like, uh, uh, they become, uh, they can become numbers. It depends on the model, but, uh, but uh, they, it transforms into, into clusters. In, it aggregates like uh, this, this customer is zero, this customer is one. Uh, it depends a little on the model. And you also have fit transform, which uh, is, uh, is more computationally uh, cheaper than, than calling fit and then transform. When you want to use the same data, it's, it's, it's faster. Okay, other, other data mining problems could be something like reinforcement learning, uh, to learn, uh, for instance, to make uh, an artificial intelligence to play a game. And uh, here, this, this one is, is harder to, um, to these harder than the others, and I'm not going to get here, here because you don't, you cannot compute an immediate error. The problem is with reinforcement learning is that you only know if you made a mistake after making several predictions. Okay, this type of problems is harder than, than the others because of that. You only know if you made a, a mistake after several predictions. Okay, if you predict like uh, go here, then go here, then then shoot, then something else. Only then afterwards, this is, this is the, the, the kind of learning that we need to play chess and to play other things. Okay, and uh, there are some, some, other model, some other kind of problems. Th this is very subjective, right? It's very subjective because some people uh, will say that, uh, for instance, uh, for instance, um, uh, how do you say, recommender systems. For instance, recommender systems, you could place them maybe in classification. Other people might disagree, so it's, but okay. Uh, so we are going to talk some use cases now. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be a bit complicated because we're kind of running sh short of time. Uh, so um, this, this talk was supposed to last for an hour and it's almost an hour. Uh, so perhaps we could, uh, I don't know, for the use case part, we could later provide the material to the, to the audience. That will be okay with you. Um, 
I'm sorry, but uh, that's uh, that's kind of the thing we try to schedule. We try to schedule a thing that will last an hour. Um, do you? I, mean, I don't have any, any. I don't mind staying in the hotel half an hour or something. Like I mean, uh, are you? Do you guys still? Um, are you feeling kind of already be tired, or do you want to take a break, or uh, or will we proceed with the presentation, or just skip to the networking part? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, so how much time do you have for your use cases and stuff? Uh, I would say uh, at least 20 minutes, perhaps. 20 minutes. So, are you ready for 20 minutes more? Do you please. For more numbers, data crunching and stuff? Okay. <laughs> okay, please go ahead with all the examples and all the hard stuff. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I believe it's... Uh, Okay, it's my turn. So, I'm gonna really make it brief. Um, I'm gonna show you a use case for uh, applying signal processing on real, real data. Um, so I'm just gonna skip it quite quickly. So let's assume that um, you guys are... Okay. Uh, let's, assume if you, let's assume you guys use like a Fitbit or a wearable that has an, an, an embedded heart rate sensor, okay? And let's suppose you take for, for a walk or do all sorts of daily activities and you monitor your heart rate a long time, okay? Uh, with Python you can easily uh, do that kind of analysis. So here I'm importing two example logs. I import this into a, a data frame, okay? And then I use the uh, embedded plot function, function on this data frame object, then I just plot the heart rate, the heart rate uh, um, values on time. Uh, you can see they're kind of different. You can see that blue one is kind of more, uh, more consistent oscillatory behavior compared to the red one. Um, so let's try to uh, describe this a little bit. Let's see if we, uh, let's see if, um, if we take some summary statistics about these logs, we can get something meaningful. Uh, so um, we can you can call this function, which is called describe, okay? And he immediately immediately shows you a table that shows some summary statistics, okay? Like the function the length, the mean, standard deviation, and so forth. Um, you can see here that it's not really um, helpful to differentiate the signal. So what we could do? We could perhaps. Uh, um, convert these signals to, the, to a frequency domain representation. So we're going to compute the power spectrum of the signals um, using the periodogram approach, okay? So this uses the, uh, the SciPy package and the sub package call, uh, called signal, which is specific for signal processing functions, okay? So I pretty much just call the function, pass some parameters, okay? And um, and this is what it looks like with this approach, okay? So um, here we have the frequency domain representation of these signals. Um, this is one approach to compute this. We have another, there's another one we can use, which will be the Welch approach, which uh, looks, which pretty much you just call a different function, okay? The other one you called pre-diagram, now you call Welch, and it's pretty much the same code. And it kind of looks like this now. So it's kind of a smoother uh, thing. Um, the thing you can notice between those signals is that the first one, the frequency contacts more spread out over the frequencies. The blue one is more focused on this particular area, this peak, which peaks around uh, at around uh, 0 0.015 hertz, something like that. Okay, so let's uh, see another type of representation. We could compute a spectrogram of these signals, which is pretty much uh, a time frequency representations of signals, okay? So we just um, call a function on, matplot, on pyplot, which is called spectrum. You pass the parameters, and it looks like this for the first series, okay? And then it looks like this for the second series. Uh, you can notice that uh, the low frequency contact, the y-axis indicates the frequency, uh, the x-axis indicates the time. Um, you can notice that the, the, there's a lot of power on the, on the very lower frequencies, right, right, really near to the DC component. So you could like do a, a low-pass filter, but I'm just going to subtract it by the mean, okay? It's pretty much just removes the DC component, the signals, 
and uh, gonna, I'm gonna compute the spectrum, spectrum again and now you have a more um, discernible uh, um, view of the signals on this domain. Okay, so this is for the first one, this is for the second one. Okay, uh, so now we're just gonna take the series two, which is like the signal which was as its power was more focused on that peak. Okay, so we're gonna just use apply a band bandpass filter on it of this particular type. Okay. I'm gonna define the cut frequencies to these respective frequencies, okay? I'm gonna design it with uh, this function, which, which allows to design uh, infinite impulse response filters, okay? Then I'm gonna filter it once, then I'm gonna filter it twice, forwards and backwards, in order to remove the delay that's um, inherent on the duplication of this kind of filter. So, um, you have the original signal on red, okay? You have the signal processed by a single filter forward wise in blue, okay? And then you have the um, signal was filtered twice, forwards and backwards, on um, purple, okay? So that's some of the things you can do uh, signal processing wise with, uh, with Python. Uh, so I'm gonna now pass the word, give the word to, um, okay. to Ricard. Okay. He's gonna talk about text mining with Twitter. Yes, I'm going to try to get fast. So, um, so when we use case, let's do some text mining. Uh, simple, simple things. So, um, so we are going to, to use uh, TriPy, or we can use any 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 package for. Uh, we we could actually use uh, where live directly, right, from Python to to access Twitter. The Twitter already has an API for, for use. So we are going to we are going to get uh, 100 real uh, Donald Trump um, Donald, Donald Trump tweets. So we are going to generate here a vector of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the text of those tweets. Okay. Uh, so uh, each element in this list is a string. Okay. Uh, we can use scikit-learn to do text mining. Uh, this is something uh, fairly recent in scikit-learn. Uh, previously, uh, we would have to use other packages, which are still interesting, but here we are going to use scikit-learn. So the first, one, one approach in text mining is, uh, is to lose the, uh, the spatial order, just, just uh, use uh, frequencies, okay? So we are going to create a matrix that has for each word in the columns and for each document in the rows, we are going to say how many times that word appears uh, in the document, okay? So this is for tweets, right? Uh, let's, let's, uh, <clears throat> what to, okay, we have this matrix, so we, what we can do now is to do the sum of the documents. So for each word, we have how many times uh, Donald Trump said America, how many times it, it said big, okay? We are going to sum here the, the uh, zero axis, so the zero is the, the lines in the matrix, okay? We are going to sum and see how many times he said each word. Okay, we have here, so the most popular word, at least in these 100 tweets, is uh, the word great, okay? Donald Trump, Donald Trump likes to say great a lot. Um, <clears throat> so, what kind of things can we do with this? Okay, we can try to compress these words, okay? We have here many words, we can try to find only two words that are written using the other words, okay? And uh, what do we want to, mi to minimize here? Uh, we want to ex we want we want the new words to explain as much variance as we can. So, if two words appear together, they should form, they should become, they should uh, have a high coefficient. If uh, uh, for for at least one of the words. So, if every time I say rain, I say uh, umbrella, uh, they should have a high coefficient. Okay. And uh, they should come, uh, and uh, they should be part of one word. So one of the words is going to is going is going to contain the most related, the most correlated words, and the other are going to to, to contain the other correlated words, um, and uh, they explain uh, they explain variance in lower order. Okay, uh, we are going to use like uh, we can use the LDA for this. Uh, usually use LDA because uh, this is a sparse matrix, so it has a lot of zeros 
and the traditional clustering doesn't work very well for this. So usually we typically have to, to use uh, more appropriate, uh, more appropriate uh, clustering methods. <clears throat> so uh, that's, why, uh, that's what, uh, what we did here. And uh, now what we are going to, I'm going to plot, I'm going to plot in the x-axis, I'm going to plot the beta one against the beta two of, of this word, okay? The, in the x-axis, I'm going to, to plot beta 1, and the, in the y-axis, I'm going to plot this. This will be one point. Another point will be this, this beta and this beta, okay? Uh, so, in the end, in the end what, what I'm going to get are correlated words. So, every time that Donald Trump says news, he says fake, fake news, okay? Uh, every time it says like a day, it, it usually comes from honor, honor day, okay? These are, these are words that have a similar coefficient, so they, they are related. I'm not going to, to enter into my, more detail on this, okay? Uh, but uh, we can do the same for Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa, the Portuguese president. So we are going to have like family and Deus together. So he, every time he talks about family, he also talks about God uh, and things like that. And, uh, okay. Uh, okay, so this is the last use case. I think I, 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 I still have a little time. Okay, uh, so let's, let's discuss a little bit traditional learning versus deep learning, okay? Uh, what, we have done, what we have done in, uh, in text mining is traditional learning. Uh, and uh, we are going to see why, why is that, okay. So let's use, the, for instance, the data from this Kaggle competition. The Kaggle is a website for competitions, for uh, data, data mining competitions, okay. Uh, in that website, we can have this competition that has 25,000 uh, 25, images of cats and dogs. Uh, uh, they are balanced, okay. Uh, they are uh, split in half, okay, dogs and halves, half for each, okay. Uh, we are going to, to use scikit image for, uh, for some things, for instance, to, 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 to read the image into a matrix, okay? We are going to use scikit image for that. That's another, another package, okay? We are going to transform it to, into grayscale, gray okay? We want to, to do something far fast, okay? Instead of having three channels, RGB, we are going to have one channel, grayscale, okay? Then, for instance, we can do the histogram, so we have, we have values from 0 to, to 1, okay, uh, 1 will be the, 1 will be the, the black, no, 1 will be the white, and, and 0 will be the black value, right? So if we do, if we do the, the histogram of the colors, uh, we are going to obtain something like this for this cat, and something like this for this dog, and uh, we can use, oh sorry, we can, we can use each bin, okay? Each one of these bins can be a variable uh, that we can use to predict uh, whether the image is a cat or a dog, okay? We can do the histogram, then use each variable as a, a predictor, as a, as a descriptor, as a feature descriptor for, to predict the image, okay? Uh, let's, let's use another image. Uh, let's use another feature, I mean. We can, we can use something like a histogram of oriented gradients. Um, which, which, what it does is the magnitude of the deriv derivative in several directions, okay? Um, the, the, the derivative, of course, is the differences in discrete. So, uh, so if the value doesn't change mas ma much in one direction, if uh, in one of the directions the values are more or less the same, it's going to be close to zero. If they change a lot in that direction, then the derivative will be high and uh, it will have a, a, a big impact. Um, well, the this program of the arc is a little more compl more complicated with this. It actually it concatenates several histograms like this, but I'm going to I'm simplifying this. Uh, so we have these features, and now we can use machine learning. Okay, uh, we can use, for instance, a decision tree. Okay, that tries to 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 separate as much as it, it looks at every feature and at every value and it finds a rule that separates the best at each node, okay? And we are going to, to truncate it at, at three, okay? We get something like this, okay? Uh, using using the, those features, okay? This is, we are uh, using cross-validation. We need to use cross-validation because we don't, we don't want to model 
to, to try to predict using the same data as it was used to train it, okay? We want separate data. So what you do is to use cross-validation. In this case, we are going to separate the data in three, and we are going to use the other halves for the to test model, okay? Uh, so we are going to, we are going to, to get this, this accuracy. So 50% will be random, Okay, if you want to predict if an image is a cat or a dog, 50% will be what we expect by a random chance. So this is better than the, the random, right? This is only like a, a small, uh, you, you can easily have more, much higher accuracy than this. Okay, just, uh, so this is traditional learning, where you get data, you extract features from the data, for instance in the text, I extract the counts, okay? Here I extract these features, and then we use these features to predict, okay? We don't use the data directly, okay? Deep learning is when we use the data directly, okay? This is a term uh, much used, okay, we use the data directly. Uh, for, let's, let's go back to the linear regression. So we have the linear regression where we, we multiply the variables with a coefficient and you sum that and you get the predictive value. Okay, something used a lot in deep learning is neural networks, okay? What is the idea of neural networks? The idea is to do linear regressions inside linear regressions, okay? And we apply, we apply non-linear transformations between this, this is important, the non-linear transformation, we apply it between each, each nested linear regression. But you can have several nested linear regressions. You can have a linear regression inside a linear regression inside a linear regression. Okay, we can have very, uh, very, very many layers. Okay, and we apply a non-linear transformation between each layer. That's that's important. Uh, okay, and for deep learning, we uh, can use a, a model like Keras. This doesn't have the, the import uh, part, but uh, it's importing Keras. That's a, a model for deep learning where you define each each layer. Uh, I'm not going to, to get into details here, but. Uh, but uh, you, you define the, how many nodes it has, it has each, each, each layer and then other properties as well. Uh, here I actually got a lower accuracy than the traditional uh, machine learning approach because uh, I did this, uh, I did this uh, in early, but uh, we probably, with that amount of data, deep learning probably will work best in this case, okay? Deep learning work, works better when you have lots of data, okay? Traditional machine learning works, works better when you have uh, lower data. Why is that? Because, uh, because these models are very complex and uh, they can easily uh, find uh, uh, correlations where they don't exist, okay? That's why uh, you, ca you can also use these models with a lot of colorization, which I haven't used here. Okay, so what can you use for deep learning? The, the base packages are, are something like these three, and there are more, of course. Tian and TensorFlow are the main ones. Uh, PyTorch is getting popular. Uh, these ones, the, the, um, the reason why PyTorch is getting popular is because the, it can build uh, graphs dynamically. Your, your, uh, instead of compiling your neural network at the beginning, it can adjust to the data, okay? But these are the main ones, Tian and TensorFlow. And then there are, uh, there are higher level packages. For instance, Keras is the most important one, which abstracts some things from TN and TensorFlow, and it can actually use either one, depending on what you have installed in your system or what you define it to be, okay? Keras is very nice. Keras is this code. It's very easy to use. These ones are more complicated. TensorFlow is from Google. It's, a, it's more recent than TN. It's developed by Google, and it's available for free. Uh, okay, uh, so just, just to finish, several architectures that exist in deep learning. We have the fully connected perceptions, that's like the linear regressions inside of the linear regressions, okay? We have convolutional neural networks. These are, um, because, because of what I mentioned, that uh, these ones have too many parameters, so can they, they can find correlations where they don't exist. So convolutional neural networks are, are good when you have neighbors. For instance, images, where you have a, a pixel is the neighbor of another. So we have a, the concept of, of neighbors. And uh, the neighbors are more important than other variables that are further apart. So you use, use less parameters, and usually you get uh, better results with convolutional neural networks. Recurrent uh, neural networks are for uh, sequences. 
uh, for instance, to predict uh, for, for text, to pre uh, you predict the first word and the second word and the third word, etc. You have something like neural Turing machines where you can you can develop. They can you can learn algorithms. You give it results, and it can learn the algorithms, operations, uh, CPU operations. Okay, uh, it's based on the idea of Turing machines that you probably guys know about if you're from computer science. And then you have autoencoders that are used to compress data. So you you predict the same data that from the input. Okay. And it can be used to, for, for compression and things like that. It's, very, it's also very interesting. And uh, if Sean wants to give the conclusions. <laughs> Hi. Okay, so um, to sum, sum it all up, um, so we have seen some, quite a few packages. We have seen um, NumPy, which is uh, the foundation of several packages that are available, like for example, SciPy and Pandas. Um, and uh, you have SciPy, which provides all kinds of extensions. Today I've showed the extension that it allows in the domain of signal processing. Yes, that's models which uh, Ricardo showed you. Pandas, I, I've also show, 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 shown you that this package in particular for uh, the manipulation. Um, then we, we've shown Matplotlib, Seaborn, uh, and book is, book is missing. Ricardo showed you Scikit Learn. Uh, during the part during his chapter about uh, data mining machine learning okay um, he al there's also this package which is uh, the extra gradient boost uh, which is very popular in Kaggle uh, if you keep up with the rankings of the win of the um, of several competitions on that site you see that almost all winning submissions use this model in particular so it's very efficient in and this is in the domain of the so-called traditional learning uh, you have Keras, which is a high-level framework. Um, open, then we have OpenCV Scikit Image, which is for image processing, which we didn't talk about in this presentation. Um, and then we have the following two that's more focused on natural language processing. Um, so, as final remarks, Python is a kind of a jack of all traits of a language. You can really, really use it for a lot of a lot of tasks, and it can really easily apply to several domains. And um, its, speed, its, its speed of development and its ease is very, very apt for uh, scientific work uh, because uh, usually you want to really iterate, iterate fast in order to get fast results and try to, uh, to go faster for your search space in order to confirm your hypo hypothesis you, you make on time. Okay, so Python is really good for that. And, um, and there's ever increasing adoption by scientists and engineers, um, especially since MATLAB uh, kind of made difficult their, with, their, with their licensing things like a few years ago. So there was kind of an exodus from MATLAB to Python in some domains. And, um, and because of this also, there was lo there's a lot more contributors to uh, make available to the community scientific libraries, okay? And, and as a final remark, Python's is sort of a de facto language uh, for some quite important advanced some fields, and especially deep learning. Like, if you see the, all the scientific papers, scientific work, and even almost, I'd say, the vast majority of things in production about deep learning, they, they use Python, okay? So, yeah, Python's pretty awesome. <laughs> okay, so, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Oh, 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 by the way, yeah. <laughs> uh, if, you guys, if you guys are interested in workshops, if you want, you can go to this URL. I sometimes uh, give workshops, most, uh, most of them are for free. So you guys, if you guys want, you can, you can this is a, for a mailing list, okay? You can put your email and you get our stuff, and then you can unsubscribe at any, any time, okay? <laughs> And that's it. Okay, so I'll show up.